Good morning, evening, afternoon. Um, oh, first things first, you'll see my title is Chief Business Officer in Codeplay. What I'm going to talk here about is software. And if anyone looks me up on LinkedIn, they'll see I've not got a software background. So this is going to be an interesting presentation. The other thing is I, my CEO, who is brilliant, he was going to be coming here tonight and he had to withdraw last minute. And when I knew he was going to be presenting, I cranked up the technical part of this presentation. So I really have been landed in it tonight so that uh, not only is it very technical, uh, I'm the wrong person to be doing this. But let's see where we go. I've looked through the presentation. I've taken some notes, so hopefully I can convince you that I know what I'm talking about. So Codeplay, uh, Sarah, next slide. Uh, Codeplay, just a one slider on the company. We are uh, based in Edinburgh. Sarah doing the advancing or do I need to do it? She's done it, okay. Or could I do it here, can I? There we are. Got much okay, there. that's good. Jeremy's just given me a keyboard and covered my notes. Oh, sorry. That's okay. Right. Uh, okay. I don't know. Anyway, first slide, uh, one pager. Codeplay is based up in Scotland. You may hear a bit of a Scottish accent with me. Um, we really are we're leaders in enabling high performance software solutions. Uh, we really do get brought in with a lot of companies who, especially in this day, we're talking about risk five. Something's just gone off. Risk five. Uh, but there's a lot of new processes coming out there as Moore's Law sort of levels off. The, the greatness in architectures and processes is really uh, increasing radically uh, to continue that performance that you get out of each uh, square millimeter of silicon. Uh, so we're talked to a lot of companies with their, their swanky, smart, brilliant processors that come in. We've been around since 2002. Um, on the bottom left there, you've got the products, uh, primarily three products. Uh, stop, start at the bottom. Computer Autos, our OpenCL Vulkan implementation. We base everything on open standards, and there'll, there'll be a theme comes out of this presentation as we go through. Compute CPP uh, is our enabling of Sickle. Both of these are based on Kronos open standards. Uh, Sickle is very close to NVIDIA's CUDA. Uh, it's a C++ program environment, and you'll see a small sample of that later. And then you've got Akaran, which is the full umbrella of the, the system, and that brings in lots of open source uh, ecosystem libraries. Top right, you can see that we've worked with some of the, many of the, the global greats out there, um, working on their, their processors, uh, Intel, Broadcom, Synopsis, Siva. Imagination, uh, you've got Renesis for automotive, because a lot of what I talk about here is also applicable, for, not just for HPC down through edge compute, but also make it functionally safe for automotive. A couple there, uh, KMC and NSI Taxi, uh, these are highly relevant for, for Risk Five. These are based on uh, NSI Taxi's uh, fully owned subsidiary of Denso in Japan, and the Japan, Japanese government funded uh, them and then sub funded that uh, code play to do a risk five implementation uh, of our compilers and get that up to sickle so that's got a high level c++ programming environment and then the bottom tier there you've got berkeley national labs oak ridge and argon national labs these are the biggest computers in america these really are high performance compute supercomputers in there uh, we enable sickle using intel's one api we enable that onto nvidia at uh, Lawrence Barclay, which is a computer called Perlmutter. And then Oak Ridge and Argonne, they've got uh, Frontier, uh, which is based on AMD GPUs accelerated. So you can see we are working with some of the biggest, biggest computers out there, right the way down to small, uh, relatively small uh, processes like Synopsis, Siva, and, uh, and the other guys. And market-wise, you know, this technology from machine learning and artificial intelligence really does span high performance compute, automotive, cloud compute, uh, and covers, you know, just about everything from vision processing AI. So that's the one pager of Codeplay. Let's see if I can find page down. No. Maybe get page down on this. Uh, there's a little arrow thing underneath the slide. So you have to slide two. Where's the mouse first? There we go. Ah, I'll try to do it. Uh, maybe I didn't. Right, I'll press that. 
There we go. Okay, so to the presentation. Um, so loads and loads of data. There's massive data sets out there from lots of sensors that are picking up lots of uh, data from, from phones to images, cameras everywhere. Uh, so there's massive data sets and a lot of it's quite structured. Um, but then there's lots of different types of data. Uh, there's loads of new algorithms come around. Um, algorithms, uh, you know, it's still evolving. AI is still early days. Um, so there's a lot of research and advanced development to, to get the algorithms. There's huge amounts of open source and open standards. Uh, open source being uh, everything's there. We just I shouldn't, do, I shouldn't be telling you guys what open source is. And then you have open standards, which defines the API. And at CodePlay, we work with both of them. We, we create open source and then we just put it out there in GitHub. And then open standards is defining the API. We mostly work within uh, the Kronos uh, standards there. Defines market segments such as AI and high performance compute. And then you've got, how do you accelerate it? You've got graphics processor and video are the biggest accelerator of AI today. But there are so many measured probably in hundreds by now of new accelerators uh, that are accelerating artificial intelligence and machine learning. And that's where this risk five vector extension comes in. Uh, we are out there and uh, putting software to make these devices programmable. So what we're going to show here is a, a neural network acceleration uh, using the risk five. Now, a lot of the operations that you do within a neural network compute, uh, you're doing it on vectors, matrices. Uh, you've got lots of images. And so an, an image is an array of pixels. And so you've got a vector processor that's perfect for uh, speeding up that, that uh, type of processing. Uh, CPUs are not so good at this. And so when we talk about uh, CPUs here, they really are inefficient at doing this type of compute. And it's best to offload. And that, I'll use that word probably quite a few times during this presentation, offloading from the CPU to an accelerator. What happens with NVIDIA is uh, they offload onto the graphics processor. But as I said, there's a XPU, which is an expression we hear quite a lot of nowadays. Uh, it might have come from Intel, I think. But it's not a CPU. It's not a GPU. It's a, another processor, be it AI processor, neural network processor, whatever it's called. Uh, it's an XPU. And so that's what we'll talk about here and how we are going to put this neural network acceleration down onto a RISC-V for vector. So risc V. I, I hope I don't need to tell you, it's a well-defined platform and uh, it's been well adopted. One of the failings, or the biggest failings probably of, of just about every company that comes forward with new standards is they don't stand by it. They, after six months or a year or even two years, somebody's developed something of it and then it's moved on to a different API or, or something like that. The good thing about risk five is well-defined and it's robust and lots of people are now jumping on board to support it. But for a CPU, there's lots of CPUs out there, so we need to offload a model to offload that uh, to the accelerator. And the accelerator is going to be that risk five vector uh, accelerator. I hope the slides, I'm, I'm looking back, the slides are behind me here. So RVD or risk five vector extensions, uh, that's where you've got that vector acceleration. It's no longer a scalar, it's a vector, and it's good for processing many pixels at once or structured data. Uh, so vector compute or parallel compute. It's configurable at runtime and with scalable vectors, but software developers need to write software without understanding that underlying hardware. Very important. Uh, you've got people developing, writing these applications like the uh, the neural network I'm about to show, they don't want to be work, work, worrying about what is that underlying uh, instruction set. So that's where building a software platform based on standards like OpenCL and Sickle become very important. So offloads and, ver and vectorization. You can see there the, the difference. A CPU will run things scalar. It's very poor for doing matrix calculations. And that's when you want to put it off to a GPU or a vector processor or some XPU, where it will have a big array of compute in the same cycle, 
in one cycle, it will do many, many times the compute that the CPU could do. It handles the memory much better, and uh, it's a, a lot more structured way. And this is a well understood way of offloading these, these kernels of compute to some sort of vector processor. Um, it could play, we work with a, what's called a whole function vectorization, which is where within your C code, you pull out a big chunk of that and then put the whole function into the accelerator because it fits very well for, for vectorizing. So the demo, I'm going to talk, oh, we've still got open standards. Why open standards? What's open standards do we, we talk about more often than any? Sickle is a, a C++ uh, single source open standard. Both Sickle and OpenCL are from Kronos, who defined, who decided, you know, defined uh, through Kronos as things like OpenGL, which a lot of people are familiar with for graphics. So Sickle is a C++ compute language. Uh, single source. OpenCL is a bit, little bit lower. Um, originally, uh, Sickle had to sit on top of OpenCL as a compute layer. And uh, now you can actually do Sickle without OpenCL in the latest Sickle 2020. Um, but it's all open standards. Um, and, uh, you know, industry-wide definition and robust and everyone uh, buys into that. It won't disappear overnight. It will be there for a long time. And uh, there's a lot of ecosystem. I heard some of them mentioned earlier about the, the software and ecosystem of processors, no good without them. There's already a huge amount of momentum around these open standards. So you're already enabling straight into uh, an existing ecosystem. And we're already doing things like Sickle with, uh, as I say, the US National Lab supercomputers and uh, CERN is using it as well in Europe. And then there's ONNX, which is a, a open neural network exchange format. Uh, that's, a, that's not a Kronos standard, but many, many companies are already buying into that as a standard. So to our demo, uh, VGG16 is a image, um, it's a demo, it's, it's to do image identification. Uh, recognition. So it take, you put an image in the left hand side, it goes through all these different sizes of, you know, cropping the, the image, changing the resolution of it, putting it through lots of neural networks to see, hopefully at the output, there's, uh, it identifies what kind of dog this is. I must admit, when I looked at this slide, I found it amusing that they put a car in at the, in the left hand side and they get a dog out the right hand side, which is maybe not the <laughs> best for continuity, but that's what it does. It does image classification. And it's, it's not such a, a new uh, image classification these days. There are uh, newer ones, but certainly this is a good one to start with here. And a lot of the things that you do within this demo will carry on all the way through. So that's the demo, and the target is to have that running through the, the layers, the open standard layers, to get into the, the RISC-V vector accelerator. So what does it look like from the 20,000 feet? So there's a, at the very bottom there, you see we use a simulator, the spike simulator for RISC-V. It's open source, um, and we can do an awful lot with that. Then you've got Sickle enabled, but then you've got these libraries. It's all about the ecosystem, and you can see Sickle Blast, Sickle DNN, Eigen, and then the, the neural network itself. Um, Sickle Blast, is the, the um, it's, it's mainly used for matrix multiply. And then you've got Sickle DNN, which is bringing in things like convolution pooling and uh, uh, max, pool, max pooling and then soft max. These are the, the sort of main uh, operations that are, that we look to have to use. Eigen is uh, a maths library and that's enabling Nowadays, TensorFlow, Google use that a lot with TensorFlow. That's really the, the library that sits underneath TensorFlow. So we enable that through Sickle. And between these three, uh, you can optimize the operations within each of these so that they work best. You can really optimize it for the underlying architecture of your RISC-V chip. So a lot of optimization has to happen there, but that's the sort of thing you do when you're delivering your chip you make sure that these are all working well and you maintain these uh, for that 
particular architecture. So what does it look like? Uh, here we see uh, a demo for you to try out. Um, it's command line based. You can download this off our website. And it, really, it goes through that uh, VGG16 image classification. And uh, it's under, we've also got other ones like uh, ResNet under development with our research team. But that's, uh, you can look at the code and start playing around with that in C++. So Sickle and the RISC-V architecture, now you start to see a, a real chip underneath, in inverted commas, a real chip. You've got your host CPU, you've got your accelerator, you've got the, all the IP blocks around it with cache and DMA and controllers and stuff. Uh, and the interconnect is all there. So that's looking at your chip. Then you look at what we've got as core IP, which is our Sickle implementation, which we, our product is called Compute CPP. Uh, Compute MUX is a low level driver to uh, interface down to the, the chip itself. So even just with that, that gives you that Sickle C++ uh, uh, platform that you can develop on. And then you've got the libraries above it, Sickle Blast, Sickle DNN, Eigen, and that makes up our umbrella product offering, which is our closed product plus our open source uh, libraries ecosystem to enable that. So you can see how it all fits together and we still simulate that over the RISC-V simulator, but you can put other components around your risk, your spike simulator. Open source projects, we are very much believers in, we, we created Sickle DNN, we created Sickle Blast, because people that are coming from NVIDIA, uh, a CUDA environment, they're going to be using QBLAST and QDNN. So they need an alternative. They will always use these libraries and they will move them across uh, their application and they will assume all these libraries are still there. So this Sickle DNN, Sickle Blast, we just open source that. And then when you do your own chip or your own architecture, you can optimize these for the underlying uh, features of your, of your chip, your architecture. And the Eigen libraries, of course, there. Yeah. So open source libraries, uh, open source projects. Um, with this VGG16, you can see four different components coming in there. I mentioned Sickle DNN. Uh, so it uses 2D convolution. It uses pooling from the Sickle, and that just comes out of uh, Sickle DNN. Then the Sickle Blast, you've got uh, the matrix multiply, and then you've got standard libraries for transform of the, the small images as you push them through for classification. So that's the, the libraries that use. Now let's go a little bit further under the hood. What does the compilation flow look like? Now on the left hand side, I said earlier, the Sickle is a single source C++. Um, that's what you've got on the left side. You've got the host code and then down contained within that, you've got device codes that, that will run on the, the accelerator, the vector accelerator. Uh, so these are the kernels that are stored in there. And if you follow the bottom track through there, you've got Compute CPP, which is our Sickle compiler. And out of that will come the header that you will push back into the, into the CPU side. So you've got your host code side plus the header so that the, the header can call on the underlying accelerator kernels. Uh, from Compute CPP, you've also got device code, Spear V, Spear, uh, Spear or Spear V, Spear and Spear V are both Kronos defined standards as well. So these, that Spear V will then go into the device compiler, in other words, the RISC-V compiler here, and that will produce your assembly code for the RISC-V accelerator that you will recognize from uh, the ISA for RISC-V. And then that's all pushed together into on the far right hand side into a big uh, library that you will run. So that's how the, the overall compile flow goes. And then we're going to follow along that bottom line and we're going to look at individual bits of code that will run through that. So here's a bit of sickle. Um, because a neural network is actually a really, it's going to be absolutely huge and you would never get the code on a slide. So what we're going to do is simplify this right down just to a, a, a vector addition so that uh, it's just taking two vectors, adding them together, output a vector. So right from the, the top of this, you can see that uh, the first thing you do on the top part of this is you queue it up. Uh, so you prepare the, the buffers. Uh, so you've got the vector plus vector 
uh, and then the result will come out. So vector A, uh, buffer A, buffer B, buffer C, and then you chew that up. Then you get into the, the next part. Um, then you da, da, da. then you get into the bottom half of that, which is a device queue dot submit. That's where you, uh, you it's what's called passing a lambda. Uh, the code within that lambda will run on the RISC-V vector accelerator. So you pass that, uh, in this point, this lambda is called kern. You pass that to parallel for, uh, it says a parallel for function. So you pass it to that, and then that is executed. And it's executed a number of times. And you can see number of times up in the, uh, the top part of this. Here it's defined as one. So there is, in our simulation, we only have one RVV accelerator. So that's the sickle piece of the code, and you can see the kernel there that's passed on to the, uh, the RISC-V vector accelerator. So VEC-Z VEC is a whole function vectorizer. Now, the parallel semantics of this function is a single, a single program, multiple data. It's the same program that runs multiple times on multiple pieces of data. And we can compile a set of work items to that a SIMD, and each packet will execute a set of adjacent work items in parallel on a single vector unit. So you've got a single program which contains multiple instructions, and that's pushed down onto a SIMD processor. So then this is what it looks like. Uh, this is down a level below again. This is down at the, the LLVM intermediate representation. And here you can see the, within that, uh, that code, you'll see a couple of loads, a load, load, then a, a, an add, and then a, a, a store. And so that's you doing your, your vector uh, load, load, add and store. Something to note out of this, you see vscale is left as a variable. Uh, that can stay, um, I'm trying to find the expression, uh, RISC-V allows compile at uh, scalable width, so you can hold that as a scalable until compile time. And then that will compile down to the, the RISC-V assembler that you will be familiar with. And there you'll see VLE32, which is a vector load, and another one vector load, the VF add, and then vector store. Note that the V set, what's that called, VLI, that is a scalable vector with, remember I said, it can stay as a variable right up until, uh, until compile time. So there that's where the, the actual scalable vector is set. So that's the demonstration. Uh, I didn't show you the slides for a whole neural network, but I showed it, it can work in a, a prompt mode. And uh, it will run from SQL right the way down, SQL being a very high level C++ programming environment for offloading onto, uh, allows you to offload onto your accelerator. Other networks are there as well. ResNet 50 is a, a common one. Uh, we can use it on the simulator. And once you have an FPGA or you have real silicon or you want to simulate it in the cloud and accelerate it in the cloud, you can see from this setup that you can have that simulation environment. Uh, we used the spike simulator here, um, but we can clearly extend it way beyond that. That's it. Hopefully there's not too many difficult questions come out of this. Uh, just back to the, what I said at the very start. I'm not a software engineer. Thank you. The questions been coming up, hopefully not. Uh, no, but no, I, would, I, would, I would encourage people to ask their questions. Um, I've got a roving mic here. Um, um, so uh, please type your questions in the public chat if you're remote, um, or you can unmute yourself and speak if you wish to. That technology also works. 
and I'll run around with the roving mic for anyone in this room who's got uh, questions. Okay, can I start with one? Um, Please, Jeremy, go. The, the, <laughs> the Clan compiler uh -huh. that you're using, are you using the the vector support that's been added recently upstream, or have you got your own vector support? We've there? got our own vector support. That was the VEC Z I came up with, which is the whole function vectorizer. Okay, uh, is that going to go upstream in turn? No, it's part of our closed source uh, value add on our Compute Orta, which is a closed source open CL implementation. Yeah. Okay, I understand. Yeah. yeah. Um, okay, um, and then I guess the next question was, you've, you're using the vector extension, which is huge to accelerate AI. As you start to use this for real applications, are you finding that you're using all of the vector extension or that you end up only using a small subset of it? Good question. Don't know. I don't know. I don't think we've got far enough down the path to see. Um, one of the things that we see is uh, to do uh, like the CTS, the, the conformance test suite, uh, a lot of these require some fairly beefy amounts of data movement around and uh, that takes a long time to simulate, uh, but I'm not sure what, uh, what uh, it was, it's like the previous presentation that was looking at the profiling of what instructions are being used the most. I think that's uh, where this is. I don't know what ones are being used more often than anything. Okay. Um, partly that was a lead into the next talk, yeah. which is starting for the other end of let's start, start with as few as we can yeah. and then build up. Tracking. And then I had another Actually, question. let me just yeah. reflect on that as a question though. Um, the way we see it is it's, uh, we're hearing more and more what's called software first design. So that when you're designing your chip, you're designing your chip not towards what you think the, the bottlenecks are and where the, the processing improvements need to happen, but you're truly working with, uh, like for example, in automotive, you've got the full ADAS stack sitting there and companies are absolutely, and they've probably developed it on NVIDIA, et cetera. But they're starting with a lot of software, a huge amount of software already pre-existing. And so this can allow you to design your chip based on the real software that people are using out there. And that's something that's it's, it's almost reverse of what we've seen for the last 100 years, probably, uh, where it is software first design of your chip. I'm, I'm personally very pleased to hear you say that because that's exactly what my PhD was on. I was just 40, I was 40 years ahead of my time. That was the problem. Was that a hundred year <laughs> moment, was it? Yeah. Um, as, and it didn't help. It was on Byte Street instruction sets just as they were going out of fashion. But, okay, the, the last question I had, in the absence of anyone else, ask, do please ask your questions on the public chat, um, is have you considered the um, SIMD extension, the, the P extension to pack, pack SIMD extension? To risk five mm. and yeah. whether the because a lot of ai uses some inference uses quite small data data sizes mm. and whether pat simdi would work within this context i i don't know but uh, the instructions the uh, data sets that we are seeing come along are extremely large uh, so i just suspect Suspect okay. the SIMD is not going to be beefy enough for this one, and I think the RVV uh, in extensions are absolutely right for for uh, this offload that we're talking about. Just looking at the screen, lots of people appear to be typing questions, so we'll just give them a time to chat. Yes, if software Simon. comes first, that means you need to do the compiler work before you do the silicon work. Correct. Correct, Simon. Um, we're already doing the compilers and uh, that, that demo that we I was showing you there you can actually go on and see the uh, the sorry I'm laughing at the next statement um, uh, yes we already are doing the compilers we've already done that we're already demoing it and uh, yeah we're, we're pretty much ready to go with RVV uh, for compilers so we could already take and it need not start with RVV it can already start with other platforms so you could even develop it on NVIDIA with CUDA in that ecosystem and then there's a lot of tools to move from CUDA across to Sickle and then optimize it on in the Sickle environment sure. and then you yeah. can target that down to uh, be it AMD you can even target it back from Sickle back to NVIDIA to yeah. Intel when they come out and uh, there's quite a number of Sickle enabled devices coming out 
but we're already okay. able to show that for risk five. Okay, so I've got a, a follow-on question, if you can hear me there. Which we can is, hear you, um, yeah. Good, which is, so obviously um, one of the things that's going on with risk five design is they're breaking all of these large extensions into smaller extensions. So, you know, Crypto, I think, has nine extensions now, and the Vectors is probably seven or eight. So do you have options in your um, compiler tool chains to say, um, it's like simply, um, for example, with normal stuff, if you didn't want to implement hardware mass in the tool chain, you'd say just use the soft, software uh, version of the mass. Can you do the same with the vectors and say, actually, I only want to use these 20 instructions or I want to use all 400 or something. Can you actually choose which subset of the vector RVV instructions in the processor that you actually software can, um, can target? I don't know is the honest answer to that one. Uh, we work through LLVM, and I think that's even been open sourced. The LLVM, yeah. hasn't it? The uh, for RVB. Um, mm -hmm. So we're we're taking advantage of that as well. Yeah. I, I mean, don't know if that they're... answers the question. Yeah. No, I was thinking you go from C plus plus. If you're going from C C plus plus, you want to go okay. Just use that subset, and anything that isn't in that subset, you do with a soft version. So yeah, I, I, what goes on in the like, for example, Sickle DNN is there's a lot of auto-tuning goes on. So if all these instructions are available, uh, or if you want to disable some of them, uh, it will work. It's, it's auto-tuning. It's, it's almost quite a brute force uh, approach to it, where you just throw lots of algorithms for all the different matrix sizes. So a lot of the tuning happens at the higher level. Uh, but you can take handcrafted uh, kernels and optimize them yourself if you believe that uh, you, know, you might have spent years tuning, and NVIDIA has for theirs as well. Uh, and often you just say, we'll use that kernel that's been hand tuned, or you can just take a step back and let the, the, the tools decide what algorithm is best. Uh, especially for matrix multiply, you can choose from about half a dozen different uh, algorithms for matrix multiply. Uh, and it depends what the architecture is like underneath and how big the matrix is coming in, whether it's wide and short or, you know, tall and so there's all right. sorts of different sizes of matrix. So you okay. let the tool just, the, uh, it just goes off and does its self optimization. Okay, thanks. But I'm sure you could disable some of the, the vector extensions and then let it work it out. I'm not sure how that would work. Uh, thank you for that. And there's a question there from the team at Southampton, Oana Cornell and you. There's a question, sorry. Uh, following on from Jeremy's question on using subsets of the vector extension, in the future, do you think you would be? personalizing the vector instruction you would be using for specific customers or applications rather than having one size fits all. This kind of conflicts with our approach to, to life, which is standards, and to start doing proprietary extensions, which I think this is talking about, isn't yes. it? Uh, causes conflict because uh, it really, we, we believe in standards. We believe it should always be sticking to the standards. And if you're going to deviate, then uh, work within the, the organization to bring uh, these ex new extensions, these proprietary extensions into the standard rather than uh, skewing off with your own setup. Okay. Thank you very much indeed. All right. Thanks, Jeremy. Very good presentation. Thank you, everyone.